Hi everyone. Um, tonight I will talk to you about uh, how to write Scala code in a functional style. I know that's the last slot for today, so please try not to doze off and follow me. I I know it's hard, but let's try it together. Okay. Uh, before the rest, um, I'm working at Clever Cloud. Uh, we're an IT automation company. Basically, you git push your code and we make it run in production. So, updates, uh, auto restart, auto scalability, boring things, we handle it automatically and you, you can focus uh, on your code. Um, we have a few customers and one of them is DevOps, so we're happy to host uh, the CFP and most of the websites of uh, DevOps. So, if you have questions about platform as a service, IT automation, and if you want t-shirts and cool stickers, uh, come to me after the talk and uh, we can uh, exchange on, on that. Oh, I have a shitty clicker. Um, okay, I'm online, so if you have questions or remarks, uh, or if you want to uh, yeah, ask more questions afterwards, uh, please ping me on Twitter. Uh, I'm Clement D. And this way we can uh, talk on the written medium and uh, let other people uh, take part in, uh, in the discussion. Okay, so with that done, back to business. Uh, I'm so I'm CTO at Clever Cloud, but I consider myself more as a functional programmer uh, than uh, anything else. And most of my job, except CTO stuff, uh, when I still I'm still able to to code, is to uh, code in in Scala and uh, JS. Uh, to start, who's uh, writing Scala professionally or not at work? Okay, uh, I will give m a few examples uh, in Scala. Uh, I will try to explain the syntax and uh, stuff like that uh, so that uh, people not using Scala can, uh, can follow. Okay, so first pattern, a uh, really interesting functional pattern in uh, enterprise code. It's uh, zygoistomorphic prepromorphism. Uh, the type signature should be enough. Uh, with the type classes, it's, it makes kind of sense, and uh, unless, of course, you want a uh, generali generalized uh, zygomorphism, uh, but that would be a subject for another talk. Uh, more seriously, I won't talk to you about like uh, well-known names in uh, functional abstractions. I won't talk about functors of or monads or stuff like that. Um, I will, oh, clicker. Uh, I will talk about how we are able to implement it and how we are able to express uh, simple patterns uh, in a functional way. And when you are able to do that, then using these abstractions like functor monads, it makes sense and it's easy to pick up. But today it's about implementing those patterns and really basic stuff. Okay. Uh, Please remember that there are just examples, and since there are patterns, uh, there are many ways to implement them. I will try to express them uh, always as a sim in the simplest way, so that it fits in a slide and it's easier to understand. But uh, please remember that in your code base, uh, you code as you want, and there are many variations of, of these patterns. And it's just patterns that I happen to find useful, but Scala is... Uh, is about letting you choose your, your style. So it's just me saying that. Uh, don't take it for uh, granted. Okay. Um, so first thing to know uh, about Scala is that it's an it's a language that was designed to uh, mesh object orientation and functional programming, because the creator of the language, Martin Odersky, always said that. Object or orientation is not um, contradictory with FP. I, it's uh, at least he says it's orthogonal. So normally the two should not interfere, and you can choose the style you want. Sometimes you want uh, FP style, sometimes you want an OOP style. Um, the issue with that is that uh, many people uh, find lots of uh, documentation about doing object-oriented stuff in uh, in Scala because it's kind of close to Java. The object model is 
a bit more evolved than in Java, but it's close, and there is lots of documentation. When you try to go to the FP stuff, uh, however, you find that many people expect you to already know Haskell and say, oh yeah, it, it's just a Scala implementation of uh, this pattern in Haskell, like nothing to see here, don't worry. And that uh, that's why I, I gave this talk, uh, because I spent many times uh, talking with customers at Clever Cloud and companies I'm helping writing Scala codes. Uh, I kept on repeating these patterns because they were well known in other languages, but not as well known uh, in the Scala community. Okay, so most of the patterns I will uh, I will discuss are not really functional in nature. It's just that they're used to get to a functional style, and they're commonly used in functional languages. But some of them are available in imperative languages like Rust, for instance, modern languages. So first question: What is FP? There are many definitions, and the most common one says, uh, eh, it's, it's programming with function, duh. Uh, I prefer another one, uh, which is programming with value. And in uh, functional programming, uh, your program is not, uh, is not a series, a sequence of steps that you execute in order. In uh, functional programming, your program is an expression that you, you reduce, you interpret it. And by interpreting your um, expression, then your program is executed. And one thing that that uh, th that means is that uh, control flow, though how your uh, instructions are executed in a, uh, imperative programming, in functional programming, it becomes a value. Your the control flow of your program becomes a dependency graph between your values, and. That means that in Scala, almost or everything or almost everything is an uh, expression, Ex uh, uh, except uh, no, not except, uh, especially um, control structures. So you don't have a ternary operator in in Scala. You don't need it because the if block is already an expression. So the if block is not a way to jump at arbitrary uh, places in your program. It's a way to construct uh, a value, an expression. And that means that it's uh, checked by the type system. You can't have uh, uh, branches with different types uh, and then use this value in Scala. The, your if blocks have to be homogeneous. And that means also that an uh, if block without, without an else block, it's, it's uh, strange because you're, you, you need to, to express every possibility. And that's the same thing with uh, pattern matching. Pattern matching is, uh, you can see it as a switch, but the switch has a really imperative uh, uh, taste, like it says, jump this, jump there. And pattern matching in Scala is, is a way to uh, express different possibilities and act with uh, the hypothesis validated by these possibilities. So pattern matching not only allows you to uh, split cases, it also gives you access to bound variables. And that way, you are able to act on different structures and produce a value. But remember that producing a value is always uh, what matters. And this kind of reasoning, it's the same in all functional uh, languages or when you use functional style, it goes very well with typed functional programming because since your program is a huge value, then you're able to let the compiler help you with your control flow and not just uh, your value. So that, that's why uh, type functional programming is, is uh, such a, a sweet spot, is that by switching to expressing everything in values, you're able to have the help of the compiler and not just uh, uh, bailing out from compiler support every time you do a for and if. With functional programming, then, the compiler can check your control flow and not just uh, your affectations. So, with that in mind, a way to design programs in functional programming uh, is called algebraic design. Uh, it looks uh, like the term can can be scary, but it's uh, it's like a domain-driven design, but with functional tools. Basically, you observe your domain, you create 
um, a model of your domain and then uh, you implement it. And the first thing to, to do is that uh, asking yourself how can we model data. Uh, in an object-oriented uh, style, we would have an uh, object with uh, values and a behavior. That's the idea of uh, object-oriented programming. You put behavior and data at the same place because it gives you encapsulation. Uh, in a functional style, it's a bit different. Uh, we tend to use something called algebraic data types, which I gave a quickie yesterday about. So you've attended it or not? Yeah. A few loyal customers, great. Um, I will go quickly through it, uh, but an algebraic data type allows you to represent two kinds of uh, values, uh, some or types, some types and product types. Uh, first one, product type, uh, is about putting different values uh, of different types together and constructing an aggregated entity. So. Basically, in Java, it would be uh, Pojo. Uh, in Scala, we have uh, this very interesting uh, concept called case class, which gives you all the boilerplate that you, 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 you write for, uh, for Pojos for free. So you overwrite equals, hash code, uh, two strings, stuff like that. It's automatically done by the compiler back because you tell the compiler, I just want to put these values together and have an entity representing them. You also have tuples. Uh, they are lightweight and it's a bit like a case class but with less support and less clarity because you can't, you're not able to name anything in it. So to construct it, you call the constructor and put uh, several values together. And the elimination is uh, really similar. The, the pattern goes to the left of the equal sign but basically it's the same, si it's the same thing. You either in one case you put values together, and in other case, in the other case, from uh, a group values you extract them to have individual access. So first thing, like to model uh, simple data in in Scala, you should be using case classes always. If you have a class that is only there to handle data, then it should be a case class, really. In some cases, maybe, but that's a, a rule of thumb. And it's called a product type because it's like a Cartesian product. And I can go on and on about it because I find it very funny. But if I do that, I won't have time to do the rest of the talk. So um, a sum type is a less common uh, construction in, in a language. Uh, it's also called uh, a disjunction or coproduct if you want to sound very uh, category theory guy. And Stuff like that, but some type is, o some type is okay. Uh, a simple example, or I think a very ubiquitous example of a some type is that I have a value, it's either a string, a number, an object, an array, true, false, or null. Do you know it? Do you recognize that uh, pattern? Uh, it's a JSON value. So in JSON, you have either one of these possibilities. And that that's uh, what a uh, sum type is. It's just different possibilities, and you have one and only one of it. Um, in Haskell, you have direct support in the language, so you just say it like it is. And in Scala, you don't have direct uh, syntactic support for it, but the object model is uh, sufficiently advanced to let us encode it in a proper way. So we use something called a uh, seal trait. A seal trait is a trait that you can't extend from outside the file in which it is defined. So it's like a better than just saying this class if is final and nobody can extend it. You say only classes declared in this file can extend this trait. And then the compiler knows that there is a limited number of fin finite number of implementation for your trait. So let's say if it's a null, it's a case object, I don't carry a value. If it's a JSON uh, Boolean, I carry a value and I say that I'm a JSON uh, element. And so that's the way we declare it, we construct it. And to work with them, we use pattern matching. So in the same way, 
we said it's either this or this or this. When we deconstruct it, we say if it's this, then I can act with that. And that's where you, the pattern matching really shines, because let's say you have a JSON Boolean, then the, va the variable v is defined and is a Boolean. And if you like remove uh, this piece of code from the pattern matching block, then the variables become unbound and your code doesn't compile anymore. So it's way more powerful than just putting a, a guard in an if and then doing potentially unsafe operations. And another good thing with that is that if you forget to handle a case, then the compiler will issue a warning saying, ah, you forget this case, uh, I can't uh, go on. Uh, since it's uh, manual encoding, uh, we are able to like trick a bit the model and get some niceties. Um, if you've read one of the definitions of, of one of the RFCs and different documents trying to describe the shit show that uh, JSON is, uh, you will know that that uh, in some uh, declarations, a JSON value should only be a top-level JSON value should only be an object or an array. You can't have just a JSON string. It doesn't make sense. With seal traits, I can just uh, make my case class extend to seal trait. And this way, I can share structure uh, between two different sum types. So it's uh, it's really effective when you have two different sum types which share a common structure. Then you can just declare it instead of duplicating everything like you would do in Haskell, for instance. So it's a bit more powerful because it's manual, and in some cases it can be really useful. So an OP. For structures like that, you would add method and classes and let the dispatch uh, be handled this way. Uh, when you're working in a more functional uh, style with ADTs, then you add pattern match to have behavior outside from the different alternatives. And it means that in OOP, it's easy to add, uh, to add cases. You create a new file, you implement all the methods it's supposed to be implementing, and then when it compiles, you can ship it. Or um, in FP, it's easier to add functions. You add a new uh, pattern matching block, handle all the cases, and then it's done. And that's uh, the expression of something called the expression problem, uh, which, cr uh, which um, shows uh, a divide between OP and FP. Uh, it's the way you have extensibility. So, in inst for instance, in JSON, we can't expect JSON to be extended to new types anytime soon, so ADTs make perfect sense because you may want to add new operations working on JSON, but you won't add a new type in JSON. In other cases, it's different, and that's a good thing with Scala. You can you get to choose which side of the expression problem you want to sit on, and it can be a different side uh, inside inside the same project. So that's a really good thing with uh, with Scala. Personally, I'm much more comfortable in the ADT uh, side. I find it easier to read by separating data from behavior, but your mileage may vary and choose your own style. Another question with that is that, should you use uh, your own algebraic data types that you create yourself, or using uh, already uh, like already uh, defined things like uh, tuples? For instance, these two, uh, these two expressions are structurally the same. I can go back and forth between the tuple and the case class without losing information. In the second case, it's just clearer for me as a programmer that we're handling uh, with an entity representing a user. But I could do that with a tuple. And it's the same for this function. Uh, we have either in Scala letting us uh, declare that. So. My rule of thumb is that you should always go, or most of the time, go uh, towards unrolled ADTs because it will be uh, cleaner and easier to understand and it will avoid you silly mistakes. But in some cases, like uh, if your method returns a tuple and you deconstruct it right away, 
you don't uh, give the value to anyone else, then use a tuple. A seminal example would be the split function uh, on list. It returns a tuple because you don't want to handle a special case class defined just for that, or at least if you're not programming in, in Ceylon. Uh, okay, so this one, I would, I would really like to take time to talk about it, uh, but it would eat the rest of the talk. Uh, and anyways, I talked about it yesterday. Um, basically, the idea is that uh, we call them algebraic data types because they uh, behave like an algebra. And intuition, you have on uh, simple arithmetic expressions like addition and multiplication. They are carried over to uh, algebraic data types. So you can think of algebraic data types like the, w the same way you think about uh, solving uh, a simple e equation. And it's tremendously useful when you're designing data types. You're trying to go back and forth uh, between different models, trying to see if one is better than the other. Thinking about them with the algebraic properties allow you to have a clear intuition that two types have the same structure. But I I could talk about it for hours, so I will suppress myself and go. Um, and what's nice is that all the like identities you know about uh, multiplication and addition, you can express them in terms of types, and it will give you insights about how types behave. And it's it's really interesting if if you're just curious. I recommend to to do that, like saying. A times one is A. What does it mean in terms of types? It's really interesting and it's easy to do. Okay. Uh, one concrete example that I can take out of it is that since uh, algebraic data types, sum types, and product types are associative, it means that I can arbitrarily nest values uh, as I want. It boils down that either you have a really flat uh, trees. A uh, flat tree of uh, of uh, types, or you can have deeper trees. And for instance, I use this equivalence when I model uh, database entities. I go with a very flat tree to be close to the database, and then I aggregate them into um, more complete types. For instance, and I know I can do I I know it's equivalent just because I know uh, it's asso associative. Anyway, yeah, I really like this stuff, so I had planned to do a lot of things. Uh, okay, so my lightning talk is already on YouTube, so if you're more interested in that, just go look at it. It's 15 minutes, and hopefully it's cool. Uh, going back to programming with values, uh, of course, when you model addition, programming is values with values is easy. But uh, the real difficulty is that going to more real-world cases when the values are not as concrete as they were. Um, and what you do is that you put your values inside context. And you are able to express things that were not in the type system in, in values and get help from the compiler. Uh, the best example is... oh. I had a really cute gif of a kitten bursting a water balloon and then going away, so too bad. Uh, the option type uh, is for when you either have a value or you don't have it. So typically when only one thing can go wrong, then you can model it with uh, option. Um, that's what I mean by saying it's uh, programming with contextualized values. The values I'm interested in uh, we add the context of its potential absence by wrapping it into an option. And that's what you do in functional programming. Every time you um, you have a context you want to add to your value, saying maybe it's not there, maybe it's non-deterministic, maybe it's asynchronous, then you wrap it in a type adding uh, information about this context. Uh, so in uh, other languages, option is called maybe, by the way. Uh, so yeah, option is uh, useful and it's a uh, type we see when you when we start Scala. 
So sometimes we try to put it everywhere, but keep in mind that options should always and only be used uh, for a situation where only one thing can go wrong. Else you're just uh, throwing away information and you're throwing away structural information about your program and its, uh, its runtime, which is a bad thing. If you want to keep track of what went wrong, there is a type called either, and either has two alternatives, left and right. Oh, well, all my Katy Perry gifts are not working. It's it's a shame. Um, the left, the right values contain by convention the expected uh, value. So if everything went well, then you have a right containing the values, the value you're uh, you're waiting for. And if uh, it's uh, it's an error, then you get a left with the error. First thing and to remember and the first error to avoid is to use an unstructured data type to describe the error, typically using a string as an error message. You want to use an ADT to describe the error message because when you produce the error message, you have structural information about what went wrong. And if you put it in a string, then you're effectively throwing away this information. So use an ADT to represent errors. The same way that in Java we use uh, type hierarchies to represent information uh, exceptions, and we just don't throw a runtime exception. Or maybe we do, don't know. Uh, but anyway, an ISO string of something, it, it's a cut smile, and you should try to go back to something more structured. So you make your IDT and then you're able to describe your error in a structured way. And then your code is able to work on several kinds of error and in a very structured way. Okay, I'm very happy to skip those slides because Scala 2.12 was relieved uh, was uh, released uh, a few days ago with a very, very cool fix uh, on Iser, which was previously not biased. So you had, you had to say, I'm interested in the right or in the left. And there was uh, a pull request merged, which fixed all the things, the bad things I say about Iser. They're not true anymore if you're using Scala 2.12. So. Yeah, you don't need that anymore. It's cool. It just works in Scala 2.12, so thanks, and I'm very happy. It's been five years I waited for that, so. Okay, I will show you. Uh, the problem with Iser is that it's not biased. I told you that by convention, the expected value was on the right. Uh, in the right uh, constructor, and there is no map of flat. There was no map of flat map in either up until 2.12, and you had to project saying I'm interested in the value on the right. So you had to put dot right dot right dot right to have uh, proper sequencing, um, and there was different quirks uh, with return types. You regularly ended up with product with serializable with uh, with Iser, and tha that messed up a bit, type uh, inferences. So there are something called cats.xr or scalaz dot backslash forward slash, and it was basically a fixed version of Iser, um, which was biased um, uh, to the right, which has proper type inferences and stuff like that. And since uh, Scala 2.12 is released with um, proper uh, ISO support, then uh, the XOR type in CATS will be deprecated. So if you want to use it because you're st uh, stuck on an older version, then wrap it in a type alias and it will make your uh, transition uh, easier. Uh, a problem with, or a problem, uh, a specificity, let's say, of either and XOR is that they fail fast. It's just like exceptions. When an exception inf is fired, then the rest of the code doesn't execute. And 
while it can be interesting uh, in many cases, uh, there are cases which is uh, in which it's not not really what you want. Let's say you have a huge uh, form to fill uh, with many fields, and you you fill it, you submit it, and then uh, you're told, yeah, this field is in error. So you f you fix the field, you submit it again, and then it says that a second field is uh, in error because it stopped at the first error and that's a shitty way to handle forms so in some cases what we want is to be able to accumulate errors like try everything in parallel and if everything goes well give me the result uh, and if some things go wrong give me the, the errors and there is something in uh, the library cats called validated which does exactly that uh, let's say I want to validate an email I take uh, a string and I product I produce a uh, value of type validated now so in all my examples I did a very bad thing I use uh, strings for error types don't do that but it was for the talk and for brevity so either I produce a valid value a valid email or an error and it's not just a validation, it's a validation NELL. NELL stands for non-empty list. It just guarantees you that if you have an error case, you have at least one error. And you don't have the famous uh, error message saying, yeah, error, everything's fine. Uh, with the non-empty list, it gives you the guarantee that you have at least one error, which is a cool thing. And to use it, you call all your uh, your validation functions. You put them all together with the home alone operator or the TIE fighter operator, pipe at pipe. And then if everything goes well, then you are able to construct your value. And if something go wrong, then you get your error. And if many things go wrong, you get all the error at the same time. So in many cases, it's way better for the people using the API to get all zero errors in one uh, in one step. That doesn't mean that you should never use either uh, and always use uh, validated. In some cases, sequential validation makes sense. So don't try to have one type representing everything. You can always have like nested types representing different types of validations, like one type saying it's a low-level error and then uh, another type saying it's a user error, stuff like that. So just look at what the semantics of your error handling are. Uh, either it's sequential validation, like one step uh, is dependent on the, on the previous steps, or you can do parallel validation, and in that case, please use validated because it will be better for everyone. Okay. Half of my GIFs aren't working, and that's a bit of a disappointment. Uh, now that we are able to describe values, that we are able to handle errors uh, on uh, return types, I want to talk about how you are able to extend your program. You make your program grow, and you make it interact in new ways. Um, there is something called ad hoc polymorphism. Um, there is something I'm really not happy about. It's the way the object-oriented uh, community uh, hijacks the term polymorphism. Polymorphism, if you, uh, if you uh, talk about polymorphism in an OOP context, then it's about subtype polymorphism. But really, polymorphism can have different types. And the types I'm interested in, it's called ad hoc, or ad hoc polymorphism. And you may know it as just function overloading. And it's, it's nice because it's really easy to, to use. You just declare functions with the same name. But it's not structural at all. And that's why it's called ad hoc polymorphism. And in Haskell, they wanted that, but with more structure. And they came up with something type classes, uh, which are really interesting and really useful in Haskell. 
and which are really used in Scala, but nobody tells them, tells it. Or no, it's better. But a few years ago, everybody was using type classes without saying type classes, and it was a bit hard to understand. I will uh, show you a simple example with uh, a monoid. Do you know what is a monoid? Okay, uh, it's a big data abstraction. It gives you interesting properties, like you are able to combine two values in an associative fashion, which means you can split the work, do little bit of work on different nodes and then uh, put it back together. And you have a neutral element uh, saying, if I combine, let's say I combine um, a string with an empty string, I get back the original string and left and right. Uh, a first try to to model this that this abstraction um, with Scala would be to define a trait monoid, uh, declaring uh, an abstract uh, method uh, called combine. It takes a monoid and it returns the combination, which is a new monoid. And then to use it, you uh, would extend it with your type and then implement uh, combine. But there are many, many issues with uh, this implementation. The first one is that since you're using subtyping, polymorphism, you're losing information. The type signature I, I put on a combine, it says I take a monoid, but it doesn't tell you I should take the same type. Everything that is a monoid could be used, and that's a problem. Since you have to extend the trait to declare the behavior, you can't add uh, behavior to final classes. So if you declare a new behavior, you can't add it to int, for instance. And it's a shame because int behaves as a monoid. And it's also hard to encode stuff that is not uh, that is static and not uh, an instance of an object. How do you encode the neutral elements? So a solution with that would be to use uh, an external declaration. You declare this type behaves this way, but you don't declare it in the type and you don't declare it in the behavior. So for our monoid example, that would mean that we create a trait called monoid, which is polymorphic on the type uh, which implements the behavior. And you say, if something, if the A is a monoid, then it can produce a zero of type A, and given two values of type A, it combines them and gives me a new value. So you don't lose information thanks to uh, parametric polymorphism. You've got A's everywhere, and it works. You don't have any problem with final types because it's not uh, it's external, so you declare the you declare the behavior, and you don't have to extend anything, and you don't lose information, as I said. So, for implementation, I say a string behaves as a monoid, so the neutral element is uh, the empty string, and the concatenation or the uh, combination operation is string concatenation, and to use it, I pass it as a function, as an extra argument. Let's say I have uh, a, uh, an array of many values, and I want to combine them all and get a single value. Then I, I just say, tell me how this type behaves as a monoid, and I, I can do the work. And then you can uh, work with strings, with ints, with different uh, any type you want. Of course, it's a bit tedious to always pass the behavior, so we want automatic wiring. And as we always do in Scala when we want to hide stuff under the carpet, we use implicits. But that's the only use of implicit I would recommend. You say, string behaves as a monoid this way, you put it in the implicit scope, and then if you want to know how string behaves as a monoid, you resolve your implicit and you get your behavior. So the function code always uh, almost doesn't change. You just add an implicit, but at the use point, you don't have to pass it anymore, and you rely on implicit resolution to do the wiring for you. Uh, of course, it means that uh, you have to get only one behavior for one given type and a given behavior. Uh, because implicit resolution uh, expects uh, values to 
to not be um, to not be ambiguous. So this gives way to something called type class convergence. And if you have two ways for a type to ex uh, to have a certain behavior, then you should wrap it or at least express it uh, in uh, in the type system, just by doing a wrapper, for instance. That's what what is done in uh, in Scala Z and uh, Cats. It's a matter of discussion. Some people don't feel that way. Some people uh, are strongly convinced that it is the only way, and other people should not do should not do that. But as you wish, but it's always better if you try to only have one implementation for a given type and a given behavior. It will simplify lots of things. Another thing, but it's more like a hardcore functional programmers thing. If you have a type class without any laws uh, declaring how it should um, it should behave, that that type class should not exist, but Keep that in mind and maybe later uh, Google it, but for now, just modeling an operation with type class is a good thing. Uh, there is a project called Simulacrum, which does all the boilerplate for you. Um, so all the instances, stuff like that, it, it just uh, wraps it and it gives you a nice syntax. So if you're using type classes a lot, give a look or have a look at uh, Simulacrum and it may reduce a lot of boilerplate in your code. And a very good example uh, of, of uh, using type classes would be serialization. Um, if you uh, go through the commits of uh, the library uh, shapeless, there is uh, a commit of sadness where my Sabine is adding extant serializable everywhere in the code. Because uh, Spark serialization is based on this terrible way to do serialization, and some people wanted to send shapeless object in Spark. So Mice was uh, forced to to add this uh, on all the library, and that's the issue with not having a, an external declaration. Then the type has to to know about all the behavior it has to to implement. So let's say we want to implement uh, serializing something to JSON. Uh, I declare a trait saying, I can transform a value of type A into a JSON element. And for instance, for a map, I can uh, serialize a map of string something to uh, JSON if I can serialize this something to JSON. So I say, provided that I'm able to uh, transform your values uh, into JSON, then I'm able to transform map string this object into into JSON. And this pattern is really important. It, it looks advanced and complicated, but if you're using Play Framework, this pattern is everywhere when serialization is uh, is concerned. Uh, of course, JSON, DB objects, uh, query string parameters, forms everywhere. So it's not it's not told directly in the in the documentation, but this pattern is used, so you should know it if you want to really use uh, nicely play. And I say play because that's a framework I, I know uh, well, but uh, any other frameworks use uh, type class based serialization. So just for serialization, you should be able to understand this, uh, this pattern. And yeah, if you can uh, read the code of the library cats, simple parts, uh, not the category theory complicated parts. Uh, but it's uh, really easy to read code base, and if you want to learn more about how type classes work and uh, how they can be used, then CATS is a uh, is a code base to read. Okay, so next item. Um, once, so we have modeled uh, our domain model with algebraic data types, where our modeled uh, previously abstract stuff like errors with uh, values. Now uh, we know how to extend and to do uh, abstraction in, your, in our program with type classes. The next I item is how you are able to uh, model test and assertions about your program. And there is a very interesting tool called uh, property-based test, which allows you to, to write your test in a much more efficient manner. The problem with tests is that they, to quote Dijkstra, 
they only uh, show the presence of bug, not the absence. Uh, when you write unit tests, it's your responsibility to prove that in some cases it works or it doesn't work. Whereas when you do it in the type system, then it's a proof, so it's uh, it's okay for every value, but because by construction bad things can happen. And for the middle, where you can't uh, prove your property in the type system because it's too complex, but you want this kind of reasoning, saying, I don't want to test specific cases. I want to declare a property and make sure it holds. Then you can you can use uh, something called Scala check. For instance, I have three strings and I concatenate them. And I want to know that um, the length of um, the length of uh, or no, I want to know that uh, the first part of the string or the second part of the string is uh, is a string put in the middle. So instead of coming with strings by yourself, you tell the, the test framework, I want three strings, three arbitrary strings, I don't really care which ones, and I just want to make sure that this property holds. And then the test framework is able to test properties for you. So you get the kind of reasoning uh, for all values, like you're asking the framework, for all A, B, and C strings, please check that this property holds. And it will try hundreds or thousands of cases to make sure it holds. And it's not your responsibility anymore to provide the test cases. Because if your algorithm doesn't handle well a case because you forgot, you've forgotten to handle it properly, then you won't uh, think about it when writing your test. And you want that some something on somebody else provide the test cases to to make sure that you've s you've sort of everything and you're not uh, skipping uh, skipping steps. So it's hard at first to express uh, properties, but and maybe you can't do it for everything, but try try to to uh, to write tests in a property based fashion. Like, m even if you're using a regular unit test, instead of saying the result of this function should be literally this value, try to express it into a property. Like, for instance, I have a program where I was doing uh, tree merging. And instead of saying the result of the merge should be this exact tree, which is not interesting, I was able to say if uh, these two, those two trees are, are merged and I insert this tree at this uh, position, then the result should have the initial tree at this position, stuff like that. And I don't have, I, I don't have literal values. I just construct properties in terms of the initial values. So it's hard to do that at first, but please try to, to do that because it's very efficient. And even if you don't use Scala check, you just use your uh, uh, type framework, it will just make your test easier to maintain. Because it's terrible when you change something simple and you have to rewrite all your tests because all your tests are based on literal values and they check some, some properties that you don't care about. So with that, your tests become way smaller and way easier to, uh, to extend. Okay. Once you've done all that, and I keep so fast forward, so don't expect it to do it in two weeks. Uh, but once you've done that, the next step you should try to do is to separate FX from logic. What I mean by effects is that something affecting the outside world, something not being just evaluating an expression. So when you do that, your logic code, instead of doing what it's supposed to do, you make it produce a value encoding its decision. And then you're able to test it. And then you have another part of your code that interprets this decision and do the actual stuff. But by separating those two pieces, you are able to test the first one. It's, it's just function calls. 
So you don't have to to set up states or God forbid uh, use mocks stuff like that. You just don't need it because you take a decision and you encode it in a value, and then you inspect that value. That's all. Um, you also are able to batch stuff, uh, filter stuff afterwards. In fact, when doing that, you're decoupling your program and you're enabling yourself to add modification or duplicating stuff without changing the core logic. So, let's say <coughs> I have um, I have a, a piece of code that takes user information and adds it into uh, the database. Instead of doing that, you have a function taking user information and producing a value describing the action you have to do. Or for a bank, instead of directly transferring the amount, you issue a transaction saying transfer this, a this amount of money from this account to this account. And then you are able to replay stuff, you are able to batch transactions, you are able to do what whatever you want because you interpret uh, your effects as you wish. So you declare actions and then the expression we commonly use is to interpret them at the end of the world, which means farther as the core of the program, as farther as the prov... Uh, sorry? Okay. You interpret them as far as the core of the program as you can. Typically in a web application, that would mean you only do effects in the controllers. All your logic is pure. You take values, you, produ you produce a decision. And then, just before sending like the response, then you, you do your effects and you interpret your values. This way, the core is able to do everything and you don't have to worry about, hey, if I call this function, will it talk to the DB? I don't know. And you don't have to think about calling function in the right order because it just values. So that gives you like a huge improvement in testability because no more test setting, no more mocks, just checking values. Uh, you have a lot of uh, flexibility. You can batch, deduplicate. You can log the effects somewhere. You can place them back. Uh, basically, what every every advantage of event sourcing, it's the same. Uh, event sourcing is doing that at the architectural level, but you can do that at the program level, and it, it works very well. And you can even uh, go back in time. You can fix a bug retroactively by replaying all your events with the fixed code and replace replacing the bug as values, just because you were able to describe what you did instead of just doing it. And then if you go to Scala conferences, people will start talking about free monads. Free, mon free monads is just taking that a step further, but you don't have to, to use free monads. You can just declare your action with case classes and ADTs, and it will already be a really good improvement. Okay, so to finish, first thing, use ADTs to uh, model your data and please try not to mix behavior and data. Case classes, they're made for one-liners. So case classes, like you just declare uh, components and you don't declare methods on case classes. This way you have very, um, very dense and uh, very easy to read uh, declaration of uh, how your uh, data looks like and then you put code uh, after that elsewhere. Don't use uh, nulls or exceptions to uh, declare errors. By putting them in values, not only it's clearer for the programmer because it appears in the type system, but since it's values, then your code is able to work with them. Uh, combining e exceptions, it, it's, really it's really hard to do because you have to do try catch and stuff like that. It's, it's really complicated. As soon as your errors are modeled with, with data, then it's just another function. You can combine them as you want. You can do what you want because it's just regular data. Um, to do abstraction, type classes are really interesting and are really useful in SCAR. So at least 
if the the simple the simplest way to do it is like you're working on a web application, you have to hook up into the serialization mechanism, and you do that by using type classes. So take time using type classes is really easy to do. Defining them it's another thing, but being able to hook up into type classes is really important and really useful to have proper abstractions. If you can try property-based testing, be advised it takes time to get in the mindset of testing properties instead of uh, literal results, but when you can do that, it's it's really powerful and it, it's a huge step forward. And then, like in uh, maybe a few months, when everything is okay, try to separate uh, logic from effects. Uh, maybe not in small projects; it's not useful. But in big projects, I can assure you that it will help you a lot and will buy you maintainability uh, in the long term. So in really small projects, in really small crowd projects, maybe it's not useful. But in big projects with complex logic, I can assure you it's a good thing to do. And once you've done all that, or while doing all that, uh, there is a book, the red book, called uh, FP in Scala, uh, Manning Editions. Uh, just read it. I it's, it's a really good read. Uh, just the first chapter is a great introduction to functional programming, so even if you don't have time to read it in one go, just look at it from time to time. The way they uh, describe uh, definitions and, and problems is, is really interesting. Thanks for your attention. I know it was late, and I hope it was not too hard to follow. And yeah, uh, you can give CleverCloud a try. There is a coupon to extend the, the free trial. And now if you have questions, I'm all yours. Yeah, you can upload if you want. <laughs> Thanks. Okay, uh, three minutes left for questions, so shoot. Yeah, so the question was about uh, do I suggest a framework to uh, do property-based testing? Yes, uh, this framework is called ScalaCheck and it will uh, give you that. It integrates well with ScalaTest and everything, so you can use it uh, standalone, but if you're already using ScalaTest, there are integrations and matches and stuff like that to make it natural. Yeah, that uh, that uh, the trap with property-based testing. If you if you like replicate uh, the algorithm in your test, then that's not really useful. So what you want to strive to to do is to find simple properties. Um, and essentially, when you have uh, business constraints, uh, you go from uh, these constraints to the algorithm. And usually the algorithm is more complex than the constraints. So these constraints are a good way to, to write your uh, property-based testing. But yeah, if you're writing your algorithm in the test, then it's not useful and you should probably, uh, you would probably better do to, uh, to write a regular test. So that's the issue with property-based testing. But most of the time, you uh, are able to find simple properties that are more simple than the algorithm to, to test. Okay. Okay, thanks. I have stickers and t-shirts. <laughs> <laughs>